Pure TV Go app එක දැම්ම දාගන්න. Pure TV Go, SNT Pure TV, TV බලන හොඳම විදිය. Tonight, a self-probe. Did the police slip up leading to nine suspects being freed on bail? Police Headquarters Special Investigation Unit has begun an investigation to check whether those suspects were released on bail. Lessons of 9-11. Former US Ambassador to Sri Lanka Robert Blake believes that the island nation can learn from the United States and should revert back to a fluid intelligence sharing mechanism. In fact, you did have such a group before the war and during the war when Gotabaya Rajapaksa was defense secretary. The current government should think about it, re-establishing some kind of group like that. Staunch stance. The prime minister digs his heels in and insists that existing laws are insufficient to combat terrorism. Terrorism law, certainly not under the existing law. Taking control. The president intends to bring the Batikla University under state purview. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine this Wednesday, the 8th of May 2019. IADX, 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 From Adha Verana, this is Adha Verana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhammik Ekanayaka. Now search operations continue to be conducted island-wide with one such operation yielding 56 swords from a public well in the area of Maligawat of Colombo today. The other than a reporter on the ground covering the event was the object of much opposition from a group of people present at the scene. The police, however, had to intervene to control the situation. Security services discovered 44 swords imported from China, 12 other swords, 49 knives, 26 CDs with Arabic writing, one firearm and illicit drugs from a well adjacent to a mosque in Maligawatha today. The 20-foot well was searched as part of the ongoing island-wide search operations. As the events were being covered by the other Derna reporter, a group of people attempted to intimidate him. <laughs> Meanwhile, 16 knives were recovered from a parcel in one of the garbage piles collected by workers of the Colombo Municipal Council at Arnold Ratnaikamawath in Maradana. Two persons were arrested after a stash of sharp weapons, including swords, were found at a house in the area of Kumukkandura in Teldenia. Meanwhile, two employees of a poultry farm in Siamalaga Sweva of Anuradhapura, meanwhile, were arrested after some suspicious items, including two swords and several checkbooks, as well as ATM cards, were found in their possession. Police also took an LED bulb, which had an inbuilt surveillance camera, into custody. In Dambulla, a tip-off led to the discovery of six pistol ammunition and two anti-aircraft shells submerged in Dambuloya. Meanwhile, a motorcyclist was arrested at the Tungandahena police checkpoint after a stash of ammunition including 270 56 ammunition, 649 bullets used for 9mm pistols, 101 bullets used for training, 10 MPEP ammunition and two magazines were found in his possession. Another upgraded air rifle was also found from the suspect's house in Atrogiria. A truck driver and his assistant were meanwhile arrested at the Mutuadia police checkpoint in Sidhu yesterday after 1,116 outfits similar to the army uniform was discovered in their truck. Meanwhile, 26 swords and three air rifles were handed over to the police by public in Sidhu police division yesterday. The police and the STF conducted search operations in the vicinity of a house belonging to one of the suspects who destroyed Buddhist statues in Marmanella. A section of the Mahoeli River was also searched during this operation today and Navy divers found five swords, two knives locally known as manna and three other knives. In the meantime, five persons were arrested following a brawl in Matale last evening between a group of people and members of the national Tawhid Jamaat. All involved persons are of Islamic faith. 
Meanwhile, the Navy recovered two large paint tents containing explosives from Kalini River near Malwana today. Police also found CDs with symbols of the National Tauhid Jamaat left along the SM Donald Peraramavati in Kohilavatta. Former Provincial Councillor of the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress, Shafi Rahim, who was arrested yesterday after eight communication signal jammers were found at a house in Igambo, was remanded until the 22nd of May. The ruling was given after the suspect was produced before the Nigambo Magistrates Court today. Meanwhile, police today revealed that its Special Investigation Unit has launched a probe into any possible slip-ups by the police leading up to the court decision, which saw nine suspects arrested pertaining to Easter Sunday attacks being granted bail. The probe was confirmed by police media spokesperson S.P. Ruan Gunasekara. In the meantime, a person who attempted to bribe a police officer to ensure bail for a suspect in remand custody was nabbed by officials of the commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption. He attempted to coerce the officer in charge of the Horopatana police station into withholding objections over his acquaintance as Bail, who is a member of the National Tauhid Jamaat. Officials of the Commission to Investigate Allegations of Bribery or Corruption today arrested a person who attempted to bribe the officer in charge of the Horopatana police station. The suspect had solicited to ensure bail for Abdul Majid Mohammed Niaz, a member of the National Tawhid Jamaat, who is in remand custody until the 14th. 26-year-old Mohammed Shifan, who had introduced himself as a close relative of Mohammed Niaz, was arrested today while attempting to bribe Horopatana police OIC Sugat Roshan Sanjiva with cash. Police had identified Mohammed Niaz as an active member of NTJ who had direct links with its leader, Zahran Hashim. Niaz has also worked as a teacher of information, communication and Islam religion at the Timbiritao Muslim College. He had also held a directorial position at an Arabic school named Rifadi. Police say Mohammed Niaz's bank accounts received heavy remittances on a frequent basis from bank branches in Mawanella. On 28th April, Horopatana police has arrested an individual who was suspected to be a member of the extremist terrorist group of 21st attack. The suspect was remanded till 14th May by the Kabeti Golava Magistrate Court. One relative of the above mentioned suspect promised the officer in charge of Horopatana police that he would give him 500,000 rupees for no objections to release the suspect on bail. According to the information given by the Horopatana OIC, the suspect's relative was taken into custody by the commission to investigate bribery or corruption officers while the relative tried to give him a payment of 250,000 rupees in advance as a bribe. Later, the suspect was remanded until the 21st of May after being produced before the Anuradhapura Magistrates Court. Meanwhile, the police media spokesperson also gave an update on the release of nine employees on bail who were arrested from a copper factory which allegedly belonged to Ahmed Insam, a suicide bomber involved in the attack at Shangri-La Hotel. The decision to release the suspects was discussed at several platforms as the police failed to inform the magistrate under which act they produced the suspects before court. Police Headquarters Special Investigation Unit has begun an investigation to check whether those suspects were released on bail because of an error from Vellampitiya police officers. President Maitri Palasirisena today engaged in an observational tour in Sainda Marudu where a terror attack took place on the 26th of April. He emphasized that right of the people to live peacefully has now been ensured. During an event in the area, the head of state said that the much scrutinized university in Batikle will be brought under the purview of the Ministry of Education. President Maitri Palasirisena today visited Sainda Marudu in Kalmune where a suicide attack was carried out on the 26th of April. The president assured government officials of the eastern province that measures related to national security have been revamped following changes to security forces. The head of state emphasized that therefore right of the public to live peacefully without any fear has now been ensured. Subsequently, the head of state met with Muslim youth in the province during which he pledged to end terrorism within Sri Lanka. Expressing views on the much scrutinized university in Batiklo, President Sirisena said that the university will function under the purview of the Ministry of Education while letting it function as a private university. The president's media division said that during his address today, the head of state revealed plans to discuss with relevant officials over the establishment of a separate Pradeshya Sabha for Sainda Marudu. 
Following these events, the president then engaged in an observational tour at the site of the terror attack. <laughs> Robert Blake, the former U.S. ambassador to Sri Lanka, has some inter interesting views about the prevailing security situation in Sri Lanka. Stay tuned. After this break, Robert or Blake coming up. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Other Therana 24. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, former U.S. Ambassador to Sri Lanka Robert Blake considers the intelligence apparatus which was in place during the tenure of former Defense Secretary Gotabe Rajpaksha to be highly effective. The former U.S. Ambassador touched on the topic while addressing a seminar in Colombo yesterday dubbed Update from Washington, U.S. Foreign Policy towards China and South Asia and what it means for Sri Lanka. He believes that IS, where the United, um, IS, where the United States, uh, he believes that where the United States went wrong, rather, as the government only learned the harsh lesson in the aftermath of the 9/11 attack. Given that is the case, Blake urged the current Sri Lankan government to have a rethink and revert to a strong and fluid intelligence sharing system adopted by former Defence Secretary Gotabe Rajpaksha in combating this latest terror threat. Our military to military relations have expanded from the days when I was ambassador. In the last years of the war in 2008 and 2009, human rights concerns almost completely circumscribed what we were able to do on the military front. We stopped exercises, we stopped training, we stopped almost everything with the Sri Lankan Army and the Sri Lankan Air Force. The only exception was the Navy. And I fought very hard to maintain contacts with the Navy because, I, first of all, I felt they were extremely important. Secondly, the Navy was not guilty of serious human rights abuses. We had a direct interest in helping Sri Lanka to stop these armed shipments to the LTT in the north because, of course, we didn't want to see those be used against innocent civilians. Today, I'm really happy to see that all of the restrictions that we had placed in 2008 and 2009 have all been removed. And in fact, our military is looking for ways in every way we can to support the growth of the Sri Lankan military across the board. Our law enforcement cooperation has strengthened and obviously there's no better sign of that than the immediate deployment of FBI personnel to help with the investigation of the uh, Easter bombings. And I must say, since I've been here for the last two days, I've heard quite encouraging reports of how the security services in general have conducted themselves. So, so well done on that. I think Sri Lanka can learn from the mistakes that America made after 9-11 as well. Most civil liberties experts believe that the United States overreacted by expanding government surveillance without appropriate constitutional checks. I think Sri Lanka can also benefit from another U.S. lesson that we learned after 9-11. One of our biggest mistakes that led to 9-11 was our failure to properly communicate between our intelligence and law enforcement agencies, particularly the FBI and the CIA and the various law enforcement agencies. So to improve interagency communication and coordination, then President Bush ordered a new committee to be established under one of the deputy national security advisors in the White House. And under John Brennan, they had, they had very, very senior people of all of the relevant intelligence and law enforcement experts. And they met on a weekly basis to evaluate all of the intelligence against the United States. I think having a high level group of technocrats like that is something that Sri Lanka could, de could definitely benefit from. In fact, you did have such a group before the war and during the war when Gotabaya Rajapaksa was defense secretary and he personally chaired that and made sure that all of the different uh, branches of intelligence, of which there are many in this country, were sharing information and then sharing that information up to the senior level people. And then they themselves were making sure that somebody was looking into those and making sure that, they, they, that the attacks didn't take place. So I think that's a, a very important thing that current government should think about is reestablishing some kind of group like that. In the meantime, commander of the Sri Lanka Army, Lieutenant General Mahesh Senanayake, believes the recent re-establishment of the overall operational command is the best mechanism he can think of in addressing security concerns stemming from the Easter attacks. 
The command insisted that it's bound to succeed since it's a tried and tested mechanism. Speaking with India-based CNN News 18, the army commander also voiced his, cons uh, his suspicions over possible links between ringleader of the Easter Sunday attacks, Azharan Hashim, and former LTT cadres living in South India. What is the Indian connection of this whole blast? There is no direct involvement of India in this particular incident. But one incident where it is reported is the leader of the group, Saharan Maulavi, has visited India in the south and even to the Kashmir. Question comes, why he has visited? There may be many reasons for that. We had ex-LTT cadres still living in, in South India. So there may be some sort of a link in terms of collection of warlike material in terms of explosives, weaponry, which are hidden in the north and east of country. To preserve a democracy, you have to have a strong armed force. Unfortunately, that was neglected in the last 10 years. So the time has come again for people to understand the importance of armed forces and security. Do you think they made use of some dormant logistics of the erstwhile LTT? After the war, we rehabilitated 13,169 LTT cadres. Some were not rehabilitated. So I believe there may be some sort of involvement of such people who sold them to other extremist groups. The army commander also delved into what encompasses the re-established overall operational command. Overall officer command, it has been there for a long period but it was defunct due to the peace that you enjoy. Today I have established it again under the security force command of the West. I have selected the Western province and the Putlam districts where majority things have happened and the Eastern province. So this OOC, the all Army, Navy, Air Force, Police, Civil Defense Forces are coming under him for a temporary period. Plus the intelligence agencies within those provinces and the districts will be controlled by the OOC. And that is the best mechanism I can think of as of today, which has proven in the past. Coming specifically to the northern province, there has been some disillusionment with the, with the way they were not working in coordination, the lack of initiative. Has it improved? In fact, as the army, we do not work with the political leadership. We work with the government agencies. What happened was, after 2009, the government agencies were not functioning. So it took 10 years to come to this stage. So we were the only people who had the capacity. So that is why we need a separate formula for Jaffna Peninsula, separate formula for Kilnochi, Mulatiu, Mana, and north of Vaunia. They are only nine years. But rigorous operations conducted in, from 1996, the people in the peninsula are living with Sri Lankan army. That means one generation is being understanding each other. But in Kilnochi, Mulati, still they are babies. They are only eight years old. So that is where the problem is. But we are definitely addressing their issues to ensure they will never be suffering again. Whatever the political ideology they have, whatever the agenda they do have, army has only one agenda, that is peace. Now, Indian media today quoted highly placed sources within Indian investigating agencies as saying that the two terrorist siblings who perpetrated attacks at Shangri-La and Cinnamon Grand Hotels visited India in 2012. The media report comes as commander of Sri Lanka Army, Lieutenant General Mahesh Senanaka, noting recently that some suicide bombers in the Easter Sunday attacks have visited India for some manner of training. There is no official statement from the Indian government to this tune. However, the media report goes on to say that the terrorist Joe's father's company has business interests in various cities from Kerala to Delhi. Army Commander Lieutenant General Mahesh Senanayaka speaking to foreign media recently said that the suicide bombers who carried out the Easter Sunday terror attacks in Sri Lanka had travelled to Kashmir, Kerala and Bengaluru of India for some manner of training. In such a backdrop, Indian media report that Indian investigating agencies have confirmed that two of them did in fact visit India in 2012 on business visas. However, they have refuted that the duo had received any kind of training. According to the report, two of the suicide bombers, Ilham Ahmed Mohammed Ibrahim and his older brother, Inshaf Ahmed, who led the attacks in Shangri-La and Cinnamon Garden hotels, had travelled to Bengaluru, Kochi, Chennai, Mumbai and Delhi with valid passports on business. It says that top sources in India's central intelligence agencies had said that the father of the duo, Mohammed Ibrahim, is a spice tycoon and his company, Ishana Exports Private Limited, based in Colombo, is listed in Trade India's list of verified exporters offering quality spices and copper tubes. They go on to say, quote, 
Ishana has business interests in various cities from Kerala to Delhi. Seven years ago, Inshaf and Ilham had come on a business trip. They neither visited Kashmir nor did they participate in any training camp in India, as has been alleged by the Sri Lankan army chief." Unquote. The Indian media reports further say that highly placed sources have also told them that Sri Lanka has not yet shared any leads or information that link attackers to India or their travel. The same sources had told them that the so-called Islamic State has links with the national Tawhid Jamaat and the module in South India has largely been radicalized by Zahran Hashim. They've said that NTJ may have some fringe sympathizers in India who are under watch. Staying on with the theme of terrorism, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe continues to hold the stance that existing laws in the country are not sufficient in combating terrorism. Speaking in Parliament today, the Premier stressed the urgent need to pass the counter-terrorism bill into legislation. However, opposition leader Mahindra Rajpaksha urged Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe to appoint a parliamentary select committee to examine and review the proposed counter-terrorism act. Sri Lanka we need to promote no one is at my protest of another get to put curry I'm a miss about the Lima Kara I mean I'll be able to make a summer to get a gamma kill a summer a vessel got to tell you it would know need to go to go to your trust about the electric in Sri Lanka I put here need to promote that type of that I'm going to get him as on the hours and need to put the part in the neck you know over to my April was a VC in the game passive in a car make out of parliament to give in a base to do it up rather than one work the car in a kind of a my memo got it a whole new one it up rather than one time I memo got it population Now you can bring them under that and uh, section 21 makes it uh, uh, operation it apply to anyone who has committed this crime outside sri lanka intimidating the population of syria or intimidating the population of libya therefore it's clear that all those who have returned from syria are within the ambit of the counter terrorism bill this uh, provision of the penal code was taken from the united kingdom law waging war against the queen uh, the, uh, or any friendly power but all those who return from syria have been taken in under the terrorist laws not under this even those who have returned from iraq whose central government is backed by them has been taken under the terrorism law and certainly not under the existing uh, uh, the old law ie pavaticha anshika committee edi police niladari director cid director tid e wagema videsha amathyansha lekamthuma me udawiya pahadiliwa prakasha kara mema neethipathituma me pratiprastha panatha awashya wenne naha kiyala me rate trastawadaya turan kirimata I must say this there are 1698 asylum seekers of them 869 have already been cleared as refugees in this country 440 are unqualified and they will be repatriated out of Sri Lanka within the next few weeks these people have come here as religious and ethnic minorities we the information is available with the defense authorities and the foreign affairs ministry they are cleared by the defense authorities and therefore we need to look at these people as people who are fleeing persecution in their own countries and therefore we have about a thousand of these refugees that the sri lankan government is systematically observing international law and looking at it with the united nations human rights commission in actually finding countries to resettle them the supreme court today ordered to issue notice on former defense secretary hemasiri fernando and inspector general of police puji jasundra to appear before court on the 21st of may summons were issued following a fundamental rights petition filed with the court with the supreme court that is citing the failure by hemasiri fernando and puji jasundra to prevent the terrorist attacks on churches and hotels despite receiving intelligence reports prior to the attacks the petition calls for legal action against the duo for neglecting the information Meanwhile, the Attorney General's Department informed court that it will not appear on behalf of the former Defence Secretary and the IGP.
Sri Lanka's ambassador to Russia, Dr. Dayan Jayathilaka, extends support for Russian President Vladimir Putin's idea of a global front against terrorism. Speaking to a Russian news agency, Dr. Jayathilaka said that forming military alliances will not help resolving the issue of terrorism. During an interview with the Russian news agency TAS, Ambassador of Sri Lanka to Russia, Dr. Dayan Jayathilaka emphasized that everyone can benefit from the initiative that Russian President Vladimir Putin put forward at the UN General Assembly in 2015 while highlighting the need to establish a global and united front to combat terrorism. He insisted that the Easter Sunday attacks became a lesson not only for Sri Lanka, but also for the rest of the world, as it showed that a person who is willing to kill themselves can be expected to commit any crime against morality. He also pointed out that such attacks can happen anytime, anywhere, if terrorists are given the chance to act. Dr Jayathilaka, however, expressed optimism that Sri Lanka will be able to face this threat to its existence with its experience of resistance over the years. The Sri Lankan ambassador to Russia also expressed views against against forming military blocs. He was quoted saying that in the past, military methods were used to put pressure on economically emerging countries. Such practices are completely unacceptable. They damage the idea of peaceful coexistence. Supreme Court Justice Prasanna Jayawardena today stepped down from the bench hearing the case on contempt of court against former Chief Justice Sarat N. Silva, citing personal reasons. The case against former Chief Justice Sarat Den Silva was filed following a petition by senior Professor Chandra Gupta Tenwara, Professor Heva Waduge Cyril, and Professor Prashanta Gunavardhana, claiming that a statement made by former Chief Justice during a meeting of the organization Jatika Ekamutwa in Maradana on the 3rd of December last year was in contempt of court. The former Chief Justice had allegedly expressed views regarding the court order issued against the Gazette notification by the President dissolving Parliament. When the case was taken up this morning, Justice Prasanna Jayawardhana stated in open court that he too was a member of the bench which had issued the court order in question, which was thereafter the basis for the defendant's statement. As a result, Justice Prasanna said he did not wish to participate in the hearing of the case. We're going to move in for a very short break. Stay tuned. are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel. This is Adhatherana 24. Welcome back. Now, Columbus stocks extended their losses into a fifth session today and closed at their lowest level in six and a half years on shattered investor confidence. The all share price index ended 0.18% weaker at 5,372.97, while turnover was 222.3 million rupees, lower than this year's daily average. Foreign investors bought 60.2 million rupees worth of shares. Now, we have Dimantha Mathi with a brief report on how markets performed today. Rise in liquidity led to a stop in the reverse repo auctions uh, today by the central bank and the continued uh, rise in the liquidity saw the yields also diving further. The TB auction held today saw heavy interest with uh, one year fall into 9.44%. Uh, Latter part of the day however saw a bit of profit taking in the mid ten counters after continuous declines. Equity market on the contrary remained dull for most part of the day with uh, low turnover as uh, investors recovered from the uh, Easter Sunday bombings. The rupee meanwhile strengthened by just over a percentage to close at 175 rupees and 50 cents against the US dollar. Analysts expect the local currency to weaken due to possible outflows from stocks and government securities. Let's now take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded today.
The United Nations yesterday launched a countering terrorism travel program. The travel program aims to support member states to use travel information to detect, prevent, investigate and prosecute suspected terrorists while uh, re uh, respecting high safeguards for data protection and in compliance with international human rights laws. The United Office of Counterterrorism launched the UN Countering Terrorist Travel Program, which will be implemented in partnership with the Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, the International Civil Aviation Organization, the Office of Information Communication Technology, and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. The United Nations will provide state-of-the-art software, GoTravel, capable of analyzing travel data which, based on context-specific risks, will help them to detect and track suspected terrorists and their movements across borders. Prior to pro Clay Court specialist Dominic Thiem overcame a scare to progress into the last 16 of the Madrid Open, but it was largely thanks to his opponent retiring in the middle of the match. Swiss maestro Roger Federer, meanwhile, had a much easier time on court, brushing aside his opponent from France. Roger Federer breezed through to the last 16 of the Madrid Open yesterday on his first clay court appearance for three years as Richard Gasquet was brushed aside in straight sets. The Swiss had chosen to miss the clay court season in recent years, but he showed no signs of rustiness on the red surface as he dismissed the Frenchman in just 52 minutes in the Spanish capital. Federer, who was playing for the first time in any ATP event since winning his 28th Masters 1000 title at the Miami Open in March, hit 28 winners throughout the match on his way to a 6-2, 6-3 victory. And that's it from all of us here at First of Night. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.